श्रीरामकृष्णा नम ओम नमो नारायणाय डियर सिस्टर्स ब्रदर्स एंड लविंग चिल्ड्रन टुडे वी शैल कंटिन्यू विद द रीडिंग फ्रॉम द गॉस्पल ऑफ श्रीराम कृष्णा द चैप्टर इज विजिट टू विद्यासागर एंड द डेट इज फिफ्थ ऑफ ऑगस्ट एटीन एटी टू we had seen some weeks ago how happy the master was to visit vidyasagar shri ramakrishna had wanted to visit ishwar chandra vidyasagar who was a learned pandit vidyasagar had asked him that is mahendra nath gupta what kind of a paramahamsa the master was does he wear an ochre cloth and m had answered no sir He is an unusual person. He wears a red bordered cloth and polished slippers. He has no outer indication of holiness, but he doesn't know anything except God. Day and night he thinks of God alone. So now M and Master have come to visit Vidya Sagar, who is listening to the Master's words of wisdom. very attentively he admitted that today he has heard some priceless gems about god from the master shri ramakrishna now explains the different manifestations of god's power and the master says just see how picturesque this universe is how many things there are the sun the moon the stars and how many varieties of living beings big and small good and bad strong and weak some endowed with more power and some with less so vidya sagar asks has god endowed some with more power and others with less so i'm sure many of us also wonder is god kind to a few people only the master's answer is very interesting and clears our doubts the master says as the all pervading spirit god exists in all beings even in the ant but the manifestations of his power are different in different beings otherwise how can one person put 10 to flight while another can't even face one in other words although god is in all of us his manifestations are different in each person we see how a strong person is capable of fighting even with 10 people while a weak person can't fight even with one person so all of us are not identical this variety also indicates that God's nature is infinite or God himself is infinite the master then asks and why does everyone respect you is asking vidya sagar why does everyone respect you have you grown a pair of horns and everybody laughs you have more compassion and learning therefore people honor you and come to pay their respects to you Don't you agree with me? Vidya Sagar smiled. See, Master doesn't give his own example that so many people come to visit him, so many come to take spiritual guidance from him. He never says that, but he asks Vidya Sagar that why do people come? Because they respect you and you have learning and more compassion, so people come to visit you. master explains that in each person the manifestation of god's power is different because it depends on how we lead our lives it is up to us to make best use of the human body the mind and the intellect to go forward one who works hard achieves what he or she works towards then thinking about different natures we think about vibhishan who was such a good person while his brother raman was selfish arrogant and egoistic 
So we see two completely different natures in two brothers. God, however, is the same to everybody. Each person gets the result of what he or she uh, works towards or how we behave. According to that, we get our results. Master's compassion, like God's compassion, is universal. Like a true teacher, Master wants to remove the ignorance in our hearts so that knowledge, which is already there, can shine forth. So since Vidya Sagar is a learned person, the Master wants to explain to him about scholarship. The Master continues, There is nothing in mere scholarship. The object of study is to find methods of knowing God and realizing Him. A holy man had a book. When asked what it contained, he opened it and showed that on all the pages were written the words Om Ram and nothing else. So what Master is saying is that all the scriptures teach us about God. Once we know that essence from the scriptures, all the learning, you can say, boils down to the fact that God and God alone exists in the world. God is in our hearts. God is in everyone. And with that knowledge, we feel inner joy because we know that there's nothing else in the world but God. So what Master says that Om Ram was only written and nothing else. So this is a very great statement because it implies that by Japa alone, one can realize God. In all our spiritual retreats also, we always have time set aside for what we call Likit Japa. It is for writing the holy name of God. This is a very simple and uplifting method of concentrating the mind on God. In thought, word and deed, our minds become focused on the Lord. It is as if we become absorbed with God's sweet name. The Master then asks, What is the significance of the Bhagavad Gita? It is what you find by repeating the word ten times. Gita, 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 Gi. It is then reversed to Tagi, which means a person who has renounced everything for God. And the lesson of the Gita is, O man, renounce everything and seek God. Whether a man is a monk or a householder, he has to shake off all attachments from his mind. So this doesn't mean now everybody must renounce and go to the forest or go to the cave. But it means wherever you live, don't be attached to the worldly things. The Master urges us to think about God. And the Master's own life is a perfect example of how he lived in the world, yet gave his mind to God. While most people spoke about worldly things, young Gadadhar, at that time Master was known as Gadadhar, he would think only of God. And in those days, there were many drama troops that used to go from place to place enacting scenes from the Ramayana and from the life of Lord Krishna. The master's mind was so attracted to God that he could not learn the secular knowledge taught in school like all the other children used to learn. So what the master used to do was that whatever he heard once about God, it went straight to his heart and he remembered it forever. He loved to listen only about God. So remembering whatever the actors had portrayed, he would enact all the beautiful scenes under the mango grove. And some of the children used to join him and all used to have fun thinking only about God, about Sri Ram and Sri Krishna. And obviously in these scenes, the master himself used to take the part of little Ram and little Krishna. Moreover, the master also practiced the spiritual disciplines like meditation, japa and keeping holy company. 
So as we say, this does not mean that we have to do the same. We have to study, we have to pass the exams, yet we must not neglect our spiritual practices. Sometimes we give that the least importance, yet it is most important. Ultimate knowledge is knowledge of God. In addition to our worldly pursuits, we must pray and meditate. Then gradually we learn not to be attached to the world because the world is transitory. It is here today, gone tomorrow. We must do all our duties but be attached to God alone because God is eternal and we will feel joy, we will feel satisfaction, we will have contentment and we will not suffer. This is the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita also. We must work in a spirit of detachment. Lord Krishna repeats that over and over again. Be detached, work in a spirit of detachment. Now the Master cites a wonderful example to explain bhakti or devotion. Chaitanya Deva, that is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, set out on a pilgrimage to southern India. One day, he saw a man reading the Bhagavad Gita. Another man, seated at a distance, was listening and weeping. His eyes were swimming in tears. Chaitanya Deva asked him, Do you understand what is being read? The man said, No, revered sir, I don't understand a single word of the text. Then why are you crying? asked Chaitanya. The devotee said, I see Arjuna's chariot before me. I see Lord Krishna and Arjuna seated in front and I see both of them talking. I see this in my mind's eye and I weep. So this indicates the awakening of spiritual power in the hearts. So our revered Swamiji also, our Guruji, Sri Swami Shivapadananji Maharaj used to say, initially you must imagine these things, then it becomes real. Whatever you see in your mind's eye becomes living after repeatedly thinking about it. So when we pray or meditate, we have to imagine that God is seated graciously before us. We must look at the picture carefully, see all the beautiful aspects, the smiley face, the radiant form, the beautiful clothing that the Lord is decorated with. And if it is Sri Ram, he will have the bow and arrow. If it is Sri Krishna, he will have the flute. If it is Lord Shiva, he will be meditating. So we must see all this carefully and feel that presence in our hearts. Feel that God is blessing us. Big Swamiji, our revered Guruji used to also say, feel that God's hand is over your head and feel that he is blessing you. Then it becomes real. So initially we imagine, now look at this devotee doesn't understand what is being read, but for him, Lord Krishna and Arjuna have become so real. They have become alive, living as to say, and just seeing that in his heart, in his mind's eye, makes him weep. Master now explains that we must be cautious about the ego which causes unhappiness. He says, even after the attainment of knowledge, this I consciousness comes up. Nobody knows from where. You dream of a tanker, then you wake up. But your heart goes on palpitating. All our suffering is due to this I. So what Master says that after knowing God, we should be wise. We should know that God is the doer and we are his instruments. Yet the ego or the I consciousness comes up again. After awakening from a nightmare, we should be calm and unafraid. Yet, this fear does not leave us. Every time we remember the dream, we become afraid again. 
So to be happy, to be free, the Master explains that we should say to ourselves, O oh Lord, I am the servant and you are the Master. I am the child, O oh Lord, and you are the mother. Once, Rama asked Hanumanji, How do you look upon me? And Hanuman replied, O oh Ram, as long as I have the feeling of I, I see that you are the whole and I am a part. You are the master and I am your servant. But when, O oh Ram, I have knowledge of the truth, then I realize that you are I and I am you. In other words, there is no difference. That is the ultimate knowledge. The relationship of master and servant is the proper one, says the master. Since this I must remain, let it be the servant of God. I and mine, these constitute ignorance. My house, my wealth, my learning, my possessions. The attitude that prompts one to say such things comes from ignorance. On the contrary, the attitude born of knowledge says, O oh God, you are the master and all these things belong to you. The house, family, children, attendants, friends are all yours. If a visitor goes to a rich man's garden, says the master, the supervisor says to him, this is our garden, this is our lake, and so forth. But if the superintendent is dismissed for some misdeed, he cannot take away even his mango wood chest because it does not belong to him. But he secretly sends it away with the gatekeeper and everybody laughs. So by listening to the master's sweet words, we feel great joy and we are in holy company. The words of all scriptures are the words of God himself. So just by reading them, we feel inspired because we are reminded of our true nature. In this world, we have forgotten our divinity. So when we are reminded about it again, we feel great joy. And wherever the master goes, of course now the master is present in the spirit everywhere, but now when he visited Vidya Sagar, he brought so much of joy to all of them. He removes the darkness of ignorance by the luminous lamp of knowledge. He imparted knowledge to the one whose name Vidya Sagar means an ocean of knowledge. Yet the master's knowledge clears these doubts and removes ignorance. May the master bless us with devotion to and knowledge of God. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti
Om Namo Narayanaya, dear sisters and brothers. Let us sit quietly and meditate on the beautiful form of God seated in our hearts. We can think of any form we like. The Bhagavad Gita teaches us the importance of meditation. Lord Krishna says in chapter 2, verses 66 and 67, There is no spiritual understanding for the uncontrolled, nor can he meditate. Without meditation, there is no peace, and without peace, how can one have happiness? Just as a gale carries away a ship on the waters, the mind that yields to the wandering senses carries away the discrimination. Let us make a habit of meditating every day for a few moments to feel the peace within, to feel the divine power of God within us. The more we practice, the better it is. Let us try every day for a few moments to sit quietly and meditate. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Om Sarve
search for Sita and the great battle. Dear children, last week we learnt of the abduction of Sita and the brave Jatayu who tried to save her. Ram found Jatayu severely injured, his life ebbing away. Jatayu told Ram that Ravana had abducted Sita and despite his attempts, he could not rescue her. Ram loved Jatayu as a father and was upset to see Jatayu's condition. He gently touched Jatayu's head and blessed him. Jatayu died in his arms. After performing Jatayu's last rites, the brothers continued their search for Sita. They met Kabanda, who advised them to befriend Sugriv as he would be able to assist them in locating Sita. He also suggested that they visit Shabri's hermitage. Shabri was a pious old woman who lived in Sage Matanga's hermitage since childhood and devotedly served the holy sage and his disciples. Shabri repeated the sacred name of Ram all day long. Before giving up his body, her guru or spiritual teacher advised her to wait for Ram. For many years, Shabri rose early each day and prepared for the arrival of Ram. She cleaned the pathway and then covered it with flowers so that the Lord's feet may not be injured. She collected many flowers, fruits, and nuts to feed the Lord. Many years passed and Shabri grew old. One blessed day, Ram and Lakshman arrived at the hermitage. Shabri was ecstatic. She lovingly fed Ram with the fruit she had collected. She tasted each fruit to ensure that it was sweet before offering it to her beloved Lord. Despite Shabri offering eaten fruit to Ram, he relished it because she offered the fruit to him with love and devotion. Ram explained the nine forms of devotion to Shabri. 1. Keep holy company. 2. Listen to the glories of God. 3. Offer humble service to the Guru and holy people. 4. Sing the Lord's praises without a selfish motive. 5. Japa, repeating God's name. 6. Practice self-control while engaged in beneficial activities and having virtuous qualities. 7. See the whole world as a manifestation of the Divine Lord without any distinction between good and bad. 8. Remaining content with whatever one gets and not finding fault with others. 9. Being straightforward, having implicit faith in God and remaining cheerful. Shabri received moksha or liberation and became one with God. The brothers then set off towards the Rishyamukha mountain. Sugriv was sheltering in this mountain after a misunderstanding with his brother Vali. Vali had usurped his throne and his family and banished him. The Vanaras noticed two handsome strangers walking towards them. Observing that they carried bows and arrows despite adorning the attire of hermits, the Vanaras hastened to notify Sugriv about the presence of the strangers in their space. Sugriv became grave. Noticing his anxiety, Hanuman, the bravest and wisest Vanara, said, With your permission, I will inquire about the purpose of their visit. Sri Ram met different tribes in the south of India while on his quest to find Mother Sita. To illustrate that these tribes had different habits and characteristics, they were portrayed as being different from humans. This mythological representation was purely to highlight their differences. Vanara means a forest dwelling man. A Vanara is a special type of human being having exceptional powers and strengths, like the ability to fly and lift heavy objects with ease. Hanumanji, Sugriv, Vali, and others were great scholars and administrators. Hanuman transformed himself into a young ascetic and approached Ram and Lakshman. Ram and Hanuman were instantly drawn to each other. Both felt an ancient bond with each other. Hanuman speaking in a sweet and respectful manner asked, Please tell me who you are. You bear a regal appearance despite your attire. You command respect and I feel that you are worthy of worship. Please tell me how I can assist you. Delighted at seeing Hanuman and appreciating his manner of speech, Ram said to Lakshman, 
he speaks like one who has mastered the scriptures and is a knower of Brahman, God. Ram explained that they were in search of Sugriv, who could assist them with finding Sita. Hanuman reverently disclosed his true identity and, assuming a gigantic form, carried the princes on his shoulders to Sugriv. He said to Sugriv, Do not fear these noble princes. They are in need of your assistance. After some refreshments, Sugriv explained his plight. I, too, am an exile. Vali, my brother, seized my kingdom, Kishkinda, and my queen. He wrongly assumed that I wanted to kill him, so he banished me from our kingdom. Sugriv paused. Then he said, Help me regain my throne, and I will help you to find Sita. Hanuman said, We saw Sita a few days ago. As she passed overhead, she dropped this. Ram reached out his hand. It was Sita's ornaments. Tears filled Ram's eyes as he recognized Sita's ornaments. Ram agreed to help Sugriv regain his kingdom, and Sugriv in turn agreed to help Ram find Sita. After vanquishing Vali, Ram said to him, My every act is done to uphold dharma and righteousness. Our scriptures say that the younger brother and his wife must be treated as your children, so you have failed in that duty. You usurped a throne that did not belong to you and you abducted your brother's wife. This is against the law and the scriptures. Vali acknowledged his error and thus received liberation from Ram. Sugriv regained his throne. When the monsoon began, Ram and Lakshman returned to the forest and sheltered in the Rishya Mukka mountain. They had begun their search for Sita when the rains stopped. Ram thought of Sita. He said to Lakshman, Sita must be pining for me. With her by my side, I gladly lived in exile. Her absence breaks my heart. When the sun shone again, Lakshman went to Sugriv's palace to remind him of the, his promise to help with the search of Sita. Sugriv organized his troops into four divisions. Each division would go in search of Sita in one of the four directions. His instruction was to search diligently until Sita was found. Jambavan and his tribe were also enlisted to help in the search. Hanuman, Angad, Nala and Neela, famed for their valor, went south. As Hanuman and his men searched for Sita, they reached the ocean. Dispirited at not being able to find Sita, they lamented about Ram's misfortune, Sita's abduction, and when they mentioned that the brave Jatayu was unable to save Sita, a voice startled them. I heard you mention my brother's name. Is Jatayu well? A wingless old vulture appeared before them and introduced himself as somebody, Jatayu's older brother. Hanuman told the bird about their search for Sita. Sampati could not fly, but he had telescopic vision. He was able to see that Sita was being held captive in Lanka. Angad suggested that the only way to get news of Sita would be to cross the ocean. He inquired who would be able to make the leap. The Vanaras gave modest estimates of their abilities. The wise Jambavan reminded Hanuman of his strength, saying, When you were a baby, you flew up to the sun and grabbed it. You are blessed with divine powers. Despite all your powers, you are humble and virtuous. Hanuman was thus reminded of his innate strength and his body increased in size, saying, Jai Shri Ram! Glory to Ram! Hanuman leapt into the sky. The Vanara army cheered as their leader flew across the great ocean. They were filled with admiration for his courage and devotion. Hanuman faced three obstacles in the form of Mount Mainaka, who enticed him to rest, the serpent Surasa, who tested his wisdom, and Simhika, who tried to prevent him from crossing the ocean. His faith in Ram, intelligence, determination, and courage helped him overcome the challenges. Hanuman entered the beautiful, opulent city of Lanka and went in search of Sita. Soon, he came upon Ravana's palace. He looked in each of the palace gardens, 
but he could not find Sita. How could he return without Sita or some word of her whereabouts? Then he saw a grove of trees. Beneath one of the trees was the most beautiful woman Hanuman had ever seen. She was crying and repeating, Ram, Ram. I have found her, Hanuman declared. My Lord Ram will be so happy. Hanuman noticed that Sita was surrounded by many demonesses. Just as Hanuman was about to approach her, he saw Ravana appear and say, Sita, Ram will not be able to cross the ocean and rescue you. Come to live in my palace. I will make you my queen. You can have anything you wish. Hanuman hid from view. Placing a blade of grass between herself and Ravana, Sita replied, Ram is like the glorious sun, and you are like a glowworm. You have kidnapped me. I am Ram's wife, King Janaka's daughter. Ram will come for me. He will rescue me and kill you and all your demons. Return me to Ram and beg his pardon. He is kind and compassionate and will forgive you. Overcome with anger, Ravana raised his sword when his wife Mado Mandodari stopped him, saying, It is not the fit of you to act in this rash manner. You should not kill a helpless woman. Ravana gave Sita an ultimatum to accept him within two months or face beheading. Hanuman waited patiently. The demonesses guarding Sita were getting tired. One by one, they fell asleep. Hanuman knew that if he appeared before Sita, she would assume that it was another trick of Ravana. He made himself minute, perched on a tree, and began reciting the story of Ram. Sita wondered who could know about Ram in this foreign place. Sita was surprised to see a little monkey on a branch of the tree. Hanuman alighted and knelt at her feet. He asked, Are you Sita? When she confirmed, that she was, Hanuman said, Do not fear, I am Hanuman, Ram's servant and messenger. He has sent me to find you and assure you that he will definitely rescue you. How do I know you are telling me the truth? You may just be another demon in disguise, Sita responded. Hanuman reached into his pocket and removed Ram's ring. Ram sent a message that he is well. He sent his ring so that you will trust me. Sita accepted the ring and hope entered her heart and mind. She remembered an ancient saying that if one lives with hope, happiness is sure to come. Sita gave Hanuman her crest jewel and said, Take this to my lord as proof of my love. I am sorry I doubted you. Go to Ram and tell him where I am. Tell him I will wait for him to save me. When he rescues me and defeats Ravana, his glory will be famed. I was stolen and brought to Lanka, but will leave victoriously. Before leaving Lanka, Hanuman decided to assess the strength of Ravana's army and to personally meet Ravana. We will see what Hanuman encounters in Lanka in the next lesson. Dear children, what valuable lesson have we learned today? The character of Hanuman is an ideal for all students. He was focused and determined and was thus able to learn the Vedas in 60 hours from Surya the Sun God and even while moving backwards. Hanuman is an ideal devotee and an ideal servant. His devotion and service to Ram is unparalleled. Hanumanji is always kind and helpful towards those in distress. Sugriv's plight won his sympathy. Giving up comfort and his position in Kishkinda, he became Sugriv's support. The distress of Ram and Lakshman draw his helping hands. He consoles Mother Sita in the Ashoka Grove. Hanumanji is honest and truthful, a person of integrity. He surrenders totally to Lord Ram. His relationship to God is that of a servant. This relationship emphasizes obedience. Humility is a primary requirement for prayer to be favorable. Hanuman was humble about his abilities and in his demeanor, that is his speech and behavior. Hanumanji is compassionate and helps sincere seekers to reach Sri Ram. 
Sugriv meets Sri Ram with Hanumanji's aid and regains his kingdom and family. Thank you. Om Namo Narayanaya.